Okay. So Marx thinks that uh, in another, in a way, the most important thing you have to understand about a society or a social formation is the kinds of forces of production that that society has and the kinds of relations of production. Another way of thinking about that phenomenon, that central phenomenon, and another way of formulating the basic question is how is surplus value extracted in that society? So the distinction between forces of production and relations of production is, a relative, is one way of describing a phenomenon, the central phenomenon, and another way of describing that central phenomenon is that in every society, for the society to maintain itself in existence and reproduce, surplus value must be generated. But the, but the way of generation and extraction of surplus value is different in different societies. So every society has to generate surplus value, but it's generated and distributed in different ways in different societies. And the way in which it's generated and the way in which it's, it's distributed is the characteristic which distinguishes one kind of social formation from another kind of social formation. Now, the idea here, so, so as I said in the first lecture, the early Marx is centered in a way about alienation. The late Marx is centered around the concept of surplus value. Uh, the late Marx uses the term, the, the notion, the idea of surplus value as a central way of thinking about, uh, about human societies. Now, what is surplus value? First thing is, Marx says, look, societies are historically extended processes. A society is not a structure which is timeless, that exists at a single time and produces a lot of goodies, comes into existence, produces a lot of goodies, and goes out of existence. It's a continuous thing. You build factories which people tomorrow are going to work in, which they're going to work in the day after that, etc. It's a continuous thing. A society is a historically extended continuous thing. Now, for such a society to continue to exist, it must be the case that beyond the minimal subsistence of the individual people who constitute the society, something more is produced. So we have some notion of subsistence production. That is, here I am, I'm a hunter-gatherer, and I'm chasing game through the forest, and I need to catch a certain number of pieces of game in a week in order to keep myself and my family going. If I don't, maybe I need to only buy, catch one animal, maybe I need to catch two, maybe I need to catch three. There's a certain number of animals I have to catch in order that we survive. If I can't catch an animal a week, we die. We don't subsist. Uh, now, if I'm a farmer, I sow seed, and I have to have a return on that seed. If I have 100 kilograms of seed, I, I sow the seed, and the, hundred, and, the, and the seed has to produce enough uh, grain, enough corn, for me and my family to continue, continue to exist, subsist. So there's a notion of subsistence, of the minimal amount of economic production that's necessary for the society, for the, for the people in the society, sheerly to exist. But Marx says, beyond a certain level of economic development, it isn't the case that a society produces just enough for the individual member, for the individual producer to subsist. Uh, if I'm a farmer and I need five kilo of, I don't know, I need five kilo of, of, of wheat uh, a week, I don't produce just five kilo, I produce six or seven kilo, and I do something with the surplus. So, the, so if the society really, if every one of you produced just enough to allow you to survive during the day and get through to the next day, 
you'd be living at you'd be living at a subsistence level. No, virtually no society, no historical society that we know lives at such a basically subsistence level. In all of them, the farmer who sows a hundred uh, uh, kilo of grain and needs 200 kilo of grain to survive produces 300 kilo of grain. So the 100 kilo of grain that he produces beyond what's necessary for basic subsistence is the surplus. So in every society there's something that's produced that's beyond that which is absolutely necessary for, for subsistence. Now Marx also thinks that the notion of subsistence is not a biological given in any interesting sense. Because the notion of subsistence is itself a term that refers to a historical magnitude, right? So what it means for me, what does it mean for me merely to subsist? For a slave merely to subsist, it means the slave can get up the next day and work. For a, a medical doctor to subsist in a highly complicated society, it isn't enough that the medical doctor can get out of bed the next day. The medical doctor has to be able to get out of bed and have enough mental energy actually to cure people. Uh, and Marx then also says minimal subsistence in France and minimal subsistence in Britain are different. Minimal subsistence for the workers in Britain contains Beer, minimal <laughs> subsistence for the workers in France, contains wine. So the notion of minimal subsistence is itself a historical variable. As societies get more complicated, as societies get more complicated, <coughs> the conditions that are necessary for them minimally to survive uh, become more complicated. But nevertheless, it's always possible <coughs> in any society to see that the society is producing more than is absolutely necessary, whatever absolutely necessary means, whatever subsistence means. Although that's a historically changing, uh, uh, changing notion, and although it's, uh, it's historically changing and it changes from one society to the, to, to, the, to the other in a particular historical context, there's still some sense in which, although in British society, although in French society in the 19th century, the workers had to have a pint of wine, Maybe the slaves didn't have to have a pint of wine in antiquity, so, they, so there's, there's a difference there. The, the needs of the French workers in the 19th century, the subsistence needs of the French workers are higher uh, because they're not being used just as slaves. They're actually being used as workers, so they have to have some mental powers. So they may be higher, but nevertheless, there will be something beyond that which is produced, and that's called the surplus. And now, Marx says, in some societies, so the first thing you have to ask about a society is, what is the surplus, how is it produced, and how is it, it extracted? Now, he says, in some societies, it's very easily visible how the surplus is produced and how a surplus is distributed. But in our society in the 19th century, capitalist society, what he calls capitalist society, it's not clear. It's not clear how the surplus is generated and produced. It's rather ideologically mystified. So now what are the cases in which he says it's pretty clear what the surplus is and how it's produced? He says in the ancient world, you can see how certain kind of surplus is generated. You have the masters, you have the slaves. The masters keep the slaves under dire coercion, give them only starvation wages, and work them to death. And working them to death, the masters simply appropriate everything they produce. Now, a slave in the ancient world is more productive during a day than he, then he needs to be in order merely to survive. So if you have a slave working out in your plantation, the slave, there would be no point in slavery if the slave needed to eat the whole amount he was produced, he produced during the day. You know, what would be the point of my getting a slave and sending the slave to work for me if the slave ate up in order to survive the whole amount of thing that he produced, and there was nothing left over. If there's no surplus produced, there isn't any slavery. There's no point. 
So slavery makes sense only if you can feed the slave less than the slave actually produces during the day. That's the only point to have, that's the only reason to have slaves, that you can keep them on wages, starvation rations, and extract more from them. And the extraction is very clear. It's by brute force. The slave has no rights. The slave gets a ration that's given by his master, and the master takes the whole thing that the slave produces. So there's a direct coercive relation between the masters and the slaves, and the coercive relation is one in which the master takes away the whole of the surplus value directly. Now, in a feudal society, Marx says, there is also a surplus that's produced and a surplus that's extracted, but it isn't produced and extracted in that way. In a, in a feudal society, as you know, characteristically, you'll have a, a serfs or feudal dependents of one kind or another who will have certain traditional rights and certain traditional obligations. And they will generally take, or at least Marx thinks this is the archetypical form they will take. They will take the form of saying, for example, you, the peasant family, you can live on this farm, you can use this farm, but two days a week you will work on my land for nothing. So if I'm the peasant family, I work on my own plot from Monday to Friday, I work on the, the master's plot for nothing on Saturday and on Saturday. That's why I think uh, Dienstag is called Dienstag in German, right? It's the day on which you have the service to your master, right? So you, all the other days, you know, Montag, Dienstag, Mittwoch, they're, they're days. Dienstag is the day when you don't work on your own plot, you go and work on the plot of the master. Now, Marx says, here too, there's no there's no, uh, uh, there's no uh, mystification about where the surplus is generated and how it's generated and how it's extracted. That is, it's complicated, but it's not mystified. It's complicated in, the, in, in that you ask, if you ask, how does the feudal lord, the peasant is living in his hovel, drinking muddy water and, and eating you know, chickpeas or whatever it is. The master is sitting in his hall with his paintings and suits of armor and musicians and various. Where does, where does the extra value to support these musicians and painters, etc., come from? Well, it comes from the fact that the feudal tenants work for one or two days a week for free on the master's land. And so the master has two days of free work. And that two days of free work are days during which the peasants don't produce for themselves, they produce for the master. And now what Marx says is, as in a feudal system, this is an arrangement that is locally highly variable. In some places it's one day a week, in some places it's two places, days a week, etc. It's highly variable, um, and it's embedded in a particular human relation that exists between these people, but there's no question of where uh, the surplus comes from and where it goes. The, the, the serf is not paid for, for two days' work. And since he's not paid for two days' work, he supports himself and his family on the other days, and the two days' work, everything that's produced there, goes as the surplus to the master. Now, Marx says, so they're relatively clear, but look at a capitalist society based on free labor uh, and the free contract. It would look as if, in, uh, in, a, in a capitalist society, there is no extraction of surplus value because a capitalist society operates according to a principle of the contract, of the free contract. The free contract seems to be, a free contract seems to be a contract, a free contract that's a just and fair contract seems to be a contract in which the things on both sides 
are equal. It's a fair and just contract if I give you something that's identical in value with what you give me. There's a sense of fairness or equality. So contracts, the contract seems to be voluntary, and the contract seems to be fair. And this is expressed by the, by the slogan, which is, of course, the slogan Marx hates, a fair day's pay for a full day's work. Right? For Marx, that's, the, that's not a good slogan. That's a slogan which uh, embodies the, the mystification of the capitalist uh, system. That is the idea that you could have a fair day, that, that the wage contract is just uh, and fair if it's a contract in which the master gives a fair day's wage and the uh, person who's, who's hired gives a full day's work. And they are, they are, that's a fair exchange if there's equal value on both sides. right? So that's the conception. Equal value on both sides. And if it's equal value on both sides, it's fair. If I give you an apple and you give me a pear, it's a fair exchange under the appropriate circumstances. And that is the locus of the ideology. So Marx says, that looks so obvious to us. It looks so clear. But one, it can't be true, because if it were true, there'd be no extraction of surplus value. And clearly, there is an extraction of surplus value. Bill Gates has things you don't have. Uh, there's some extraction of surplus value going on. But, but where is it? Where is the surplus value that's, that's extracted there? How do you get a hold of it? And now Marx's answer is to say, but the first thing you have to understand is that the concept of value is ambiguous as between two completely different things. There are two different kinds of value. There's what he calls a use value, Gebrauchswert, and there's what he calls exchange value, Tauschwert. And, though, and the, 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 the basic point you need to understand to understand the mature part of this theory is to see that those two things are two different ways of looking at the world. They're not substances. It isn't as if they're two different substances. They're different analytic ways of studying the relations of production in their, in their relation to the rest of life. So now use value and exchange value. Use value, he says, as the term indicates, designates simply the ability of some object to satisfy a human need. So something has use value if it's something which I can use to satisfy a human need. So this, I have a pen, and my pen has a certain use value. I can write a letter with the pen. Uh, I have an apple. The apple has a certain use value. I can satisfy my need to have something to eat. I have a cat. I can satisfy my use value by stroking her and admiring her uh, aesthetic perfection. So all of these things have use values. Now, Marx says, however, note that use value is non-comparative. I can't use the cat for what I use the pen for. I can use the pen to write uh, to uh, someone. I can't use the cat to write to someone. I can admire the cat. I can't admire the apple. Or in any case, it's a different need. So what Marx says is uses are qualitatively specific and distinct. Needing something to drink and needing uh, a dry roof over your head are different use, are different needs. And there's no comparison between them. And you can't just automatically shift one thing from another. Of course, you can in some, in some cases. You know, it used to be uh, an example that people were often get set in the first year of architecture school. Uh, take some object and just think of what other uses you could put. So it used to be that you'd, you'd come into architecture school and you'd be told, you have a telephone book. Now, to give me 100 different uses of the telephone book, apart from looking up the telephone number. And so then people would have various sorts of things as a doorstop uh, to hit a burglar on the head. So I mean, you can have objects that have different uses. But the notion of a use value is the notion of a non-comparative, non-comparable thing. 
However, things don't just have value by virtue of being useful for qualitatively specific ends. They also have value in that they can be exchanged for other things. And so uh, Marx says the aptness of objects not to satisfy an immediate qualitatively specified need, like writing to your friends or uh, having, having something to drink, etc. Not, but, but the use, the aptness of some object relative to its ability to be exchanged for other objects. That's the exchange value of, of things. Now, as he says, the notion of exchange value is inherently the notion, a notion which is differently structured from use value. Use value is, is, is dependent on the particular qualitatively specific configuration of the need that is satisfied. Exchange value is inherently connected with a model of comparability. To say that it's exchangeable is to say that I can make it equal to, the, to other things. The, I can't use the apple to write the letter, and I can't use the pen to satisfy my hunger, but I can exchange the apple for the pen. So use value is particular, is, is, is related to a particular need. Exchange value is connected to comparability, to our ability to put things a, as equal to each other. Now, uh, uh, um, uh, Marx says, well, what is, but, but if two things are equal, they're always equal in relation of some property they have. There's always something relative to which they're equal. Uh, I can say a pen and a pencil are equal, but of course, to say that a pen and a pencil are equal is not to make a sort of universal statement. It's to say a pen and a pencil are equal for certain purposes. A pen and a pencil can be considered to be equal because both of them can be things you can use to write with. So they're equal in that respect. But they're not equal in another respect. For example, if I have to sign a legal document relative to legal validity, they're not the same. So to say things are the same is always to say they're the same relative to some presupposed standard of unity. If I ask, for example, how many objects are there in this room, there's no answer to that question. Because do I count you? and your glasses as two objects? Or do I count you as one object? Do I count your bits of clothing as separate objects? So what counts as the same and what counts as different always is, relevant to, is relative to what counts as the st some presupposed relatively abstract standard of what's the same. It's the same vis-a-vis -vis this. And then Marx says, and this therefore, means that what we're looking for when we're looking for exchange value is we're looking for that respect relative to which two things can be exchanged and thought to be equal. So to say that a pen and a, and a, and a, and a pencil are the same is to say that you could write with both of them. To say that one object and another object is the same in exchange value is to compare them relative to some abstract measuring thing. And now Marx says Aristotle asked this question and he asked the question correctly. He just got the answer wrong. And interestingly enough, Marx says, and he got the answer wrong, not because he was stupid, but he got the answer wrong for reasons that tell you a lot about the nature of human thought. Namely, Marx says, Aristotle in the beginning of his work says, justice means the fair exchange, the exchange of equals. And so now, suppose it's the case that I have one house and I have 10 chairs, and suppose uh, one house is exchangeable for 10 chairs. Suppose everybody agrees that's, a, that's a, a just exchange. One house, it's a primitive Greek house, right? So it's not, a, it's not, a, it's, it's not Versailles. You can't imagine, it, it, isn't, it, isn't ten, it isn't 10 director's chairs for Versailles. It's a sort of primitive little thing. And one house is 
justly, everybody agrees justly, equal in value to ten chairs. And then Aristotle says, how, however, can one house be the same as ten chairs? They have different usia. Uh, they have different essences. They have different substances. The substance of a house isn't the same as the substance of a chair. They have different, they have completely different usii. How can they ever be exchanged with each other? And, and Marx says, and this was a question to which Aristotle had no answer. He, he, he never found a satisfactory answer of what the usia was, which one house and ten chairs both had relative to which they could be considered to be equal. And he says, if that means that Aristotle couldn't understand his own society, he couldn't understand his own society because he wasn't able to understand the basic principle of exchange in his society, because he couldn't actually explain why one house and ten chairs could have the same, uh, this, the same value. Now Marx, now Marx says, but I am in a different historical situation from the situation Aristotle was in. Aristotle was in a situation in which there was no single abstract concept of work. Rather, in Aristotle's time, there was slave labor and free labor, and slave labor and free labor were qualitatively, were thought to be qualitatively different things. You don't have to believe this. I'm just trying to explain it, first of all. This, of course, comes from Hegel's famous remark. Hegel says, Roman law could not give us a concept of homo, of human beings. Roman law was incapable of giving us, of having a single concept of human beings, because Roman law depends on there being no one single thing which is a human being, rather two different kinds of things, free humans and slave humans. You remember all the Roman legal codes begin by saying, first thing you have to understand in law is some people are slaves, some people are free, they're completely different, and it's utterly unjust to treat the slaves like the free people or the free people like the slaves. So Hegel observes this and says, look, they couldn't actually come to a definition of homo because to do that would require them to see free people and, and slaves as the same kinds of people, both in instances of homo. But they couldn't do that because their legal system depended and their social system depended on them being not two instances of the same kind of thing, but two completely different things. So, so it was the limitation of their form of production which prevented them from theoretically getting this idea that there's a, there's a definition of a human being, which is central. They, and Marx says about Aristotle the same thing with him. To understand how these two things are equal, you'd have to have the idea of an abstract unit of labor time. You'd have to have the idea that there, you'd have to have a really abstract idea, which is the idea that the world is comprised of abstractly equal units of labor time. One hour of my labor, one hour of your labor, one hour of his labor, all of them are the same. An hour of labor, or more exactly, an hour of labor considered as how much can be produced on the average in a society of that kind in that, that amount of time. So you'd have to have the idea of an abstract unit of one hour of labor time. And now Marx says, Aristotle couldn't have that because for him, in his society, labor didn't actually have this form. Labor wasn't just, I, think of what Margaret Thatcher said. We should all see ourselves as sort of corporations. And I invest one hour of labor in doing this, and I invest one hour of labor in doing this, and I invest one hour of labor in doing this. But, and Marx says, look, a traditional person in a traditional society does not see their life like that. I do not see my life as exercising abstractly indistinguishable labor units. I see myself as a farmer. And to see yourself as a farmer is very different from seeing yourself as the locus of the exercise of a certain number of abstract labor hours. So traditional societies work itself 
he says, is concrete. My work, I don't, the, the farmer doesn't say, I've got 27 units of labor power to invest. The farmer says, the tomatoes need, it, need to be done, and this needs to be done, and that work is concrete. And in particular, in the ancient world, it's concrete and it's different. It's qualitatively different. And slave labor and free labor is distinct. And the work of a potter, the work of a house constructor, and the work of a chair constructor are qualitatively different kinds of work. So Marx says, it's only in the 19th century when labor has actually become abstract. In the ancient world, you were a cobbler or you were a, a chariot maker, or you were a house maker. In the 19th century, you're a member of the proletariat, which means you have X working hours, and you may work in a cobbler's uh, factory, or this factory, or that factory. The labor itself is abstract, both in that the labor is less connected with particular skills you might acquire. You have the same skills in different sorts of, of industries. And people begin to think of their lives as composed abstractly of units of labor. This is a really, this, 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 is, a, this is part of this important uh, uh, Central European obsession with people and their relation to time, right? I mean, this is, uh, you know, what, what is my relation to the time of my life, to, to my lifetime? How do I relate to it? Do I think about the future? How do I think about my own future? How do I, do I think about my life as composed of, of homogeneous abstract units? Do I think of my time as a simple linear uh, progression with, of, of homogeneous units that succeed one another that I can fill in one way or fill in another way? Or do I think of my time and my time of life completely differently? Um, and so, this is, so what Marx says is, in the ancient world, people didn't think of their lives as a single homogeneous succession of moments, and you had to fill the moments with things. They thought of themselves as a potter, and I'm doing pots, or etc. Now, Marx says, once you live in a society where labor is abstract, you can form the idea of an abstract unit of labor, namely one hour of labor. I work 10 hours a day. I have 10 of these units. And then I can also form a second idea, abstract idea. I can think of, myself, I can think of each of these units as potentially equivalent to the units of other people. So if we're all working in the, in the industry, in the same industry, I can think of my life, uh, my shift of 10 hours as this abstract set of 10 hours things, and I can think of yours as somehow interchangeable. You do 10 hours too. And then I can also compare that over a whole industrial sector. So I can look at the average amount of time, for example, that's needed to produce a pair of shoes. So I can see myself working for an hour, and the hour then is not a concrete succession of activities. The hour is the filling of an abstract unit. And the abstract unit is the abstract unit of the average amount of shoes that a person in my society in this and these circumstances can produce. I can think of that as the abstract unit, average labor time. And so then Marx says, with this, you can see why one house can be equivalent to 10 chairs, namely one house equals, say, a 10, an average 10 units of social work. It takes the average worker in Athens 10 hours to produce this, or 10 workers working together one hour, to, because if it's abstract, it can, be it can be one person in 10 hours, or 10. And the chairs can be chairs that have the property that, given the technology available and given the skills that the people have, the average amount of time in the society that's needed to produce 10 chairs is 10. And so if the house takes 10 hours to build, 
Again, it doesn't actually take 10 hours to build because it's not a question of what it actually takes. It's a question of this notional notion of how much on the average it would take. Right? The workers you get might be drunk. They might be, they might be particularly moronic. Or they might be better. So they'll be, the, 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 the actual amount of time will be one. But, the, but the ab abstractly, for this kind of structure, in this kind of society, it should take, as it were, uh, 10 hours. And if the house would take 10 hours and the 10 chairs would take 10 hours, then you've got a unit, <coughs> which is a unit relative to which you can say they're the same. So then we can mark this unit with a mark. So we can call one hour one socially necessary hour of work, we can call that one euro, right? So one euro is the mark of, one, of an average of one hour of work. It doesn't matter what the number is, right? It doesn't matter whether this refers to one hour or 10 hours. The only thing that matters is whatever is called one euro it's the same across, right? So how you, which particular numbers you put are not relevant. It's, it's the same. Anything that costs one euro, if this costs one euro and that costs one euro, it doesn't mean they have to both, they both take one hour to produce. It just means they take the same amount of time to produce in this abstract sense of, of time. OK. <coughs> OK, that's the first part. Now, Marx says, well, if this is what value is, namely either use value or exchange value, what does it mean if I say that in the wage contract, I contract, suppose I contract to give you one euro an hour for a 10 hour work day? What does that mean? I give you, I, oh, let's say, I give you 10 euros and you give me 10 hours of work. Now he says, if you think about the justness or fairness of this transaction, I offer you 10 euros for 10 hours of work. If you think about the justness or fairness of this, you must be thinking about the exchange value. You must be thinking about the exchange value. Because the realm of fairness and exchange is a realm of that which is comparative. And use value, by the very assumption of this, is not comparative. I can't give you a pen when you want, when you want something to eat, unless you then sell it. I can't, but I can't give you a pen to eat. I can't give you a cat to write to your mother. I can't give you, unless your mother lives very close and you can pull the cat's tail. I mean, you can do all sorts of things. But I'm, do you see? So, so, the, the, so another way of putting this is labor becomes a commodity here. That is, labor becomes a thing you can sell. What Marx says is, really, in the ancient world, some particular forms of labor could be sold, but the whole system was not geared for labor to be a commodity. The system, because, because there were slaves, for slaves the labor isn't a commodity, it's an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an obligation. For serfs it's not a commodity, it's a set of complicated reactions. So labor becomes a commodity, it's traded. And then the question, so the only question when you ask whether this is fair or just is, do you have equal exchange value on both sides? Not do you have equal use value. Do you have equal exchange value on, on the side? Now, we know what 10 euros represents. It represents, in our model, 10 hours of socially average work. Now, my labor is a commodity. Now, I'm selling you my labor for a day. As a commodity, my labor has some value. What is its exchange value? Well its exchange value should be analyzed just like the exchange value of everything else. What is the exchange value of the house? The exchange value of the house is the average socially necessary amount of time that's needed to build the house. What is then the value, the exchange value of my labor for a day? 
Marx says it's the socially average necessary time that would be required to produce, we might think of it as the basket of goods and services which are necessary for me to survive till the next day. Right? How, how much do I need? How much, do I, how much is the house worth? It's, it's, it, the, house, the value of the house is this, he sometimes says, congealed labor power. That is, it isn't actually congealed labor power. That's just a façon de parler. But it's, the, the value of the house is the amount of time you need to, to produce it. The value of my work tomorrow is the amount of time it's needed to produce the things I need to work tomorrow. Okay, so that's, and that will be, and that, of course, will vary from one society to another because of the reasons that I said. Because subsistence means different things in different societies, right? So for me, it will need to be a cup of tea. It couldn't have meant that for people in the ancient world because they didn't have any tea, right? You remember, tea is not in the ancient world. So it can't be that. So, so the value of my, my work for the day will be something that you can express. Say it takes six hours. Suppose it takes, on the average, six hours to produce enough tea grain to move it from China to, so that I have enough stuff so that I can work for one day. Now, so that, what that means is that the appropriate value of my labor as a commodity is six euros. That's what it's... That's what my, my, my work is worth. My, my, the value of my labor is, its exchange value is six euros. Namely, six hours are enough to reproduce my work power. So, if the, if the capitalist gives me six euros, the capitalist has given me, as Marx says, the full value for my day of work. If the full value is the amount of, is the equivalent of the, the, the monetary equivalent of the amount of socially necessary time that's needed to reproduce me so that I can continue to work the next day, if that is six hours, then six hours is a fair wage. Now Marx says, however, so if he gives me six euros, he's giving me fair wage. If he gives me 10 euros, he's giving me a wonderful wage. But now during 10 hours of work, I might, during 10 hours of work, actually be more efficient than the average, the social average. I might be more efficient than that. And in 10 hours of work, I might produce entities that are worth 12 euros. In fact, Marx says that's the central, the central fact about capitalism is that there's a commodity, namely labor power. That commodity has an exchange value. And however, that commodity doesn't just have an exchange value, but it has a use value, which is distinct from that. And the use value is that it can produce more during a day then it needs to reproduce itself to the next day. So it's fair, Marx says, for the capitalist to give me six euros. I produce stuff to the extent of 12 euros, the equivalent of 12 euros. That means the capitalist extracts six euros worth of value from me. And as Marx says, the discrepancy between the six euros he pays me and the six euros he gets for himself, the discrepancy, he says, is ein Glücksfall für den Kapitalisten. That's a, it's a, it's a, that's a stroke of luck for the capitalist. Aber keine Ungerechtigkeit für den Arbeiter. But it's not unjust for the worker. Because what can justice mean? Again, Marx thinks justice is just an ideological term that's, or what does justice or fairness mean? Marx, Marx says justice or fairness can only mean, 
exchange value fairness, because that's the only thing that, that there is there. The only, after all, if you're, if you're thinking in terms of commensurates, the only commensurate is the exchange value. The use value is outside the range of commensuration. So fairness and justice are defined relative to exchange value. And the capitalist has done everything he needs to do completely fully to satisfy the demands of, of justice. Because he's giving you the full value. You give him something. You give him something that's worth six euros, and he gives you six euros. Now, it turns out that with this thing that he buys that's worth six euros, he produces 12 euros. Both of you produce 12 euros. But as, he, but as Marx says, that's, that's a good stroke of luck for the capitalists, but it's not unjust to you. It would only be on. So, 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 so you see how that construction works. So, Marx says, so that's the way in capitalist societies surplus value is extracted without it being visible that surplus value is being abstracted. That's why Marx at one point uh, became a, tried to become a kind of empirical sociologist. He did a thing called the enquête ouvrière, uh, a kind of Fragebogen, uh, uh, what's a Questionnaire, questionnaire, and he passed it out to workers. And the questions he asked were, what wage do you get? How much does it cost you each day to uh, get enough to live till the next day? And what is the total value of the stuff you produce during the day? And those three questions, as it were, sum the thing up. How much are you paid? How much does it cost you to survive for the next day? If those two things are the same, then you're being fairly paid. And then, the, and then he was trying, again, this was, this was one of those kind of activist interventions. Because by asking these questions, you're changing people's minds, obviously. Right? If, you, if, you ask people, if you ask people what is fair, what is just, you'll get mythical answers. But if you say, how much? If you draw their, their attention to those three things, you will enlighten them about something. It won't mean that they'll think that there's some violation of justice or fairness, because as he says, there isn't any available notion of justice or fairness according to which that is unfair. Um, it's just a Glücksfall für den Kapitalismus und kein Unglück, keine Ungerechtigkeit für die Arbeiter. Okay, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the essential claim. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, I think I'm going to stop there, actually, because I'm tired. Um, and um, I've done this for 43 years now, and I'm ready to stop. Um, and I was going to say a little bit about the critique of the Goethe program. But I'm actually, if I would just start that, I, would just, I wouldn't be able to do a good job because I'm too tired on it. So I'm just going to stop here. I'm sorry that you didn't get your last 10 minutes. but. Uh, in fairness, I sometimes did start five minutes early, so I think it's more or less the same amount of time, uh, more, roughly. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>